for those who uh, don't know me, I talk a lot, so I'm going to time myself. So here we go. All right. Um, for those of you, you know, we just talked about, which is hilarious, um, you know, the hornet, the murder hornet that's out. But I also want to bring your attention to a new insect that is out and about. It has a face mask on it. If you've seen any of those, don't be alarmed, okay? Um, just make sure, again, you take a picture of that, you send it to your county agent, joking aside. So um, what I wanna, during the COVID-19 outbreak, um, we've gotten some information of what are we doing during this time as far as pest management in and around the home or in the home landscape. Or in the landscape. So we're still doing so that. Still doing that. And, um, you know, if you're having issues with um, insects around your home, make sure you reach out to your local, um, uh, you know, pest management company and that they're still there to help you, okay? So making sure you are aware that those services are still being provided throughout the state. The first pest I wanna talk about, and I do have a story to share with this as well, um, are bagworms. Um, the one on the right is not a bagworm, that actually is a cone. The um, structure that's on the left is the actual bagworm. And so there are insects in here at the immature uh, level. And um, I, my, uh, the Hort Technician Terry Turner in Campbell County collected some for me and brought them to my office a few weeks ago. And, you know, here, Sarah, here you go. Well, guess what I found yesterday in my office all around my desk and on the wall while well, they hatched. So um, they're very, very tiny, but there are quite a few of these inside each one of these sacks here. Um, you'll see the entomology link there for more information on um, how to control. It's, it is a little challenging. Especially for homeowners, we like to recommend just hand picking those and putting them in a garbage bag and discarding those. Uh, not putting those in a compost pile, definitely don't do that. So they're very good at camouflaging themselves. Sometimes uh, people say that they've seen their tree or shrub moving or dancing and they can do that. Um, so if you see your shrub moving, back and forth and there's no wind outside and you're wondering what's possessing uh, your, your landscape plants, maybe it's because of the insects that are starting to emerge, okay? So probably many of, the, of us, especially here in Northern Kentucky, um, have seen this um, active in our homes. It's also very active outside in the landscape. This is the brown marmorated stink bug. And there are, um, other stink bugs as well, but you know, a few um, keys of identifying the differences is on their antennae, they have these stripes or bands, um, two sets of those, and also on their back abdomen um, area, they have these black and white bandings as well. Um, they're a pest inside the home during the fall and the winter, they kind of shelter themselves. Um, in very um, warm, safe places. I find them a lot in my window areas, uh, behind curtains, um, blinds, and then they just overwinter as adults and they're very um, slow moving. So you can easily catch them with a napkin and discard of those in the toilet, or if you're nice, you can put those back outside um, and let mother nature take care of them. But with, I, the good thing about that is they overwinter as adults. They're not continuing their life cycle inside the home. If you've ever smelled them, they have a very foul stench to them. So be mindful. I encourage you not to use your vacuum cleaner to um, pick them up, if at all possible. So the brown marmorated stink bug. This has a piercing mouth part. So it is an issue, especially in our orchards, and we find them in um, our vegetable um, gardens as well. So you can control these um, just like any other stink bug, but make sure you follow those directions and more information on the link there. All right. And probably those who know me are laughing right now. Um, this is by far my worst nightmare. 
aphids. Um, aphids, um, they just gross me out. They give live birth and um, they have multiple generations a year. So, uh, and I have this character here because they are able to morph themselves. And what I mean by that is they can go from wingless to wings, depending upon their food population. So if they're finished feeding in one certain area and they're hungry to keep their population, they actually morph and, and uh, have wings and then they are able to fly then to another part of your garden to continue their feeding. Then of course, their fecal matter is, um, can be an issue. It almost looks like a gray tar um, speckling on our foliage and uh, you then may see ants. Ants um, then feed on that sugary substance. So while it's today in the garden at the Campbell County Education Garden, I harvested a beautiful plant for you all. I know you're not probably going to be able to see it, but um, it uh, kind of scares me a little bit that I have this in my house, um, but there are aphids on here and I already see some of their fecal matter and I see ants. So they have a uh, relationship, the aphids and ants, um, you know, again, if you see ants, maybe sometimes they're feeding on the sugary substance left behind from the aphids. Of course, there are um, control measures of this. Uh, they have a wide host range, so we see them on weeds, we see them on our ornamentals and vegetables. When I talk about weeds, this is a good point of maybe um, one way in, uh, to control some of these pests is proper weed management. We will get to that here a little bit. The next landscape pest that many of us find um, are Japanese beetles. Uh, they too have a wide host range and um, they have chewing mouth parts. So you see um, their, the symptoms there of um, their damage on a plant there. Uh, there are other um, beetles that are, you know, look like this. And so it's the adult that is doing all the damage above the soil. And I say that because part of their life cycle, um, their instars or their immatures are developing under the soil. And controlling them um, can be challenging. And so, you know, you can go to, let's say, your rose bushes and in the early morning when they're not very active and they bunch together in the cluster of the, uh, excuse me, of the, the flower buds or the flower petals, you can actually knock those off into some soapy water. I would get a lot of phone calls of how I can control that beetle. Yes, you can control the actual adult, but if you have a high population, you may think about controlling the grubs in your landscape, though that is not always gonna be the best control because they, have, they can fly from your neighbor's area. Um, so if you're needing information on controlling, there are two different types of um, timing of application for um, insecticide. There is a preventative control, which is gonna be your greatest um, control measure. Um, and I have that circled there. Um, and the best timing of that is, is the earliest, the better um, when once the female lays her eggs. So she's gonna start laying her eggs. Of course, this is all weather dependent, but uh, July into beginning of August. And then so, they're gonna be a few inches below the soil line. And then that's gonna be your best um, timing of applying that preventative control insecticide into your lawn. Of course, then there's another um, application and that's the curative. Um, the key here is that you want to try to control as early as possible, waiting until they're about to emerge as the adult. Uh, March into April and then all the way into June, you're not going to get a good control. So at our office in the extension office, um, we've seen a decline in the population of Japanese beetles, um, though I'm not sure how it is across the state. And so we don't spray for them. Um, we go out, if I see them on our roses, we will just hand push them into a bucket of soapy water. They're pretty, um, you know, uh, sleepy in the morning. 
so that's what our control measures um, have been in our landscape. Um, I reached out to our state entomologist to see if there's any insects that I definitely need to, um, to go over today. And um, I, I did not know this, that in certain parts of the state, they're now just seeing that um, EAB are the emerald ash borer. And so this insect is very host specific and, uh, to the fractionist species or ash. And so, oh, there we go, sorry about that. And so um, if you're needing information about this beautiful but very damaging insect, make sure you reach out to your, um, your, your local extension office. And so again, it's for your fractionist species, so white ash and green ash, and if you have any blue ashes, but um, the damage is pretty uh, challenging to, um, to uh, at first to see. Uh, you'll see it in the larger, uh, the tips of the canopy. You'll start seeing, if you see up at the top left of the screen there, um, you'll see some tip dieback or defoliation. Uh, you see these D-shaped holes in the bark. Um, some, a lot of times because they're on the top of the tree, it's difficult at breast heights if you're standing at the ground to see those. They're typically going to go after the younger trees um, in large populations as well. Why, this EA, why the EAB is so um, harmful is because it actually goes back and forth into the phloem and intersects um, the uptake um, of water and nutrients. And so it quickly kills the plant. Again, um, it's not the adult, the beautiful emerald colored insect that you see that's doing the damage. All this damage is actually the larvae that is feeding inside uh, behind the bark there. So again, if you have any questions, make sure you get in touch with your local extension office and they can help um, get you in touch with the local arborist for help with controlling. Here's a map here that was sent to me. This of course was back in 2019. But I found it very interesting of the EAB. Again, I'm here in Northern Kentucky. We had this about four or so years ago. Um, it came originally from Michigan. So we, uh, of course, got it first. Um, also at the time I was an agent in Jefferson County. It was horrible. They were getting all, a lot of the ash trees and the park system there had been tr treated, but a lot also more had been destroyed and removed. So. If we're looking at the eastern part of the state of Kentucky, many of you are just now starting to see that um, insect move in. All right, we're starting to see this here. Um, and um, I just wanna bring this up and there is a difference. Um, the insect on the right is a good insect. This is your bumblebee. You see how it has, it's kind of furry. It has the stripe. Um, the very prominent yellow stripe on near the head and then towards the torso, it has that very thick yellow band as well. It's a good guy, he's our pollinator, keep him. But the fellow there on the left, that's our carpenter bee, very shiny abdomen. Uh, you're, we're seeing them very active um, in our education gardens at a gazebo and they burrow um, holes into the wood. Okay, so making sure you properly identify these guys. They're not really going after the sting you, okay? So they're working very hard to burrow because this is gonna be where they're, um, they're, they're creating their home for future generations, okay? You're needing some help with controlling of this, make sure you um, reach out to your extension agent. All right, and uh, wanna make sure that you know that there's not just bad insects out in our landscape. There are good insects in our landscape as well. So I want you, um, before you know, you see maybe a few aphids out in your garden and you know, oh, I have to go spray. What can I spray? Oh, I'll just go out, whatever I have in my cabin, I'll go ahead and spray that. Well, maybe wait a minute. Let's go out and see if mother nature would take care of it itself. So um, the ladybugs really do a good job feeding on these guys as well as praying mantis. So the picture on the right is actually an immature ladybug. So that's good. If you see that, um, 
you know, it will then turn into an adult ladybug as then you will see there on the left. So great to have in our landscape. In fact, biological control, um, integrating, you know, our biologicals into our landscape, uh, both at homeowner level, commercial level, and greenhouses and in tunnels uh, does a great job. So if you're needing more information about that, there are some local um, here in Kentucky where you can purchase beneficial insects and they'll mail them to you. Um, under the circumstance now of COVID-19, you wanna make sure you reach out um, before ordering. We have a few other that I just wanna highlight of some, um, uh, or, or excuse me, beneficials. Uh, many of you have probably seen this happening in your landscape picture on the left. Uh, maybe on your tomato plant, the tomato hornworm. Um, it's kind of interesting. This little critter who has also has chewing mouth parts will completely devour a plant, it seems as if overnight. But also overnight, it seems that these little cocoons are then planted, implanted into this uh, critter um, just as, as quick. And so this is mother nature coming to the rescue. Um, it is parasitized and um, yeah, so that slow death of that, uh, excuse me, tomato hornworm uh, would no longer be eating. So if I see these, I don't uh, use any type of chemical control. I actually just hand pick or I just let mother nature take care of it. And then we have a fly over here um, that is beneficial as well. Um, feeding on aphids and other insects in our landscape. So I will share with you some resources on how to identify beneficial insects as well. All right, come on, computer. Uh, we've already talked about that. Uh, of course, the praying mantis is a, another wonderful um, beneficial insect. All right, we, um, I just finished covering very briefly a few insects um, and the landscape. Now I'm going to just briefly go over some considerations when implementing best management practices into the landscape. I adopted this from a presentation many years ago from one of our plant pathologists. So you're thinking of this triangle that you see here. First and foremost, we want to implement prevention. So what do we mean by prevention? So maybe going out as much as possible and scouting um, your, your plants, turning over leaves, uh, making sure that there's good airflow, light um, that is being, um, you know, through your whole plant. Um, then implementing good cultural sanitation practices, pulling up weeds, like I just mentioned earlier. Uh, maybe in the um, pulling out spent plants at the end of the growing season in your vegetable garden, making sure to remove your tomato plants. Then you can, you know, as we move up into that um, triangle, maybe physical and mechanical treatments. Um, so for example, maybe you can mow down things to uh, or, or prune back. Um, you can actually hand pull things to prevent any type of uh, you know, like I said, tomato hornworm, I'm just hand picking those bagworms, I'm just hand picking those that's physical or mechanical control. Biologicals, as I briefly mentioned, there are biological controls that can be implemented. Um, tricks to know about that, especially some of our flying beneficial insects, you probably want to use some type of cheesecloth um, to making sure that you um, put that around a, let's say, a raised bed um, so that you know, you can, uh, so they're not flying away because once their food uh, sources decline, they just want to leave and maybe you want to make sure that um, you get better control with that. Oh, my PowerPoint just is wanting to go faster than me. I apologize. All right, so when you see an insect, you want to make sure that before you go out and just start spraying, there is a certain threshold. You know, if you're seeing one to two, you know, let's maybe implement some of these other um, management practices before relying on chemicals. So thinking about what type of chemical treatment to use, there are organic options and there are also those synthetics. 
Uh, we get a lot of phone calls at the extension office about implementing homemade, you know, homemade remedies. And we just caution using those, um, you know, home base, you know, using Dawn liquid soap, for example, and some water, you know, that's not what it's labeled to do. In fact, it could further damage plants even worse. So making sure that you properly get um, plants identified and if when in doubt, send photos to your agent or, you know, to the office and either the hort technician and or the agent will be glad to help you. If you have, you know, any feeding damage from that insect, please um, send that as well. That's super helpful. Under the COVID-19 situation, um, reach out to the office before physically coming to the office to drop off samples. Um, so currently in Campbell County, we have uh, our doors are closed, but with limited access, but we would be happy to assist you with proper arrangements. So just make sure, um, especially with the growing season of vegetable gardening and ornamental gardening around the corner, uh, I know there will be a lot of questions. So just make sure you get those properly identified. I want to go over just wonderful resources. Um, one of my favorites is the Cranshaw book. Uh, love this so very much. You can easily find this um, online. Very inexpensive, beautiful color pages. Um, and towards the back, you'll find tons of information about the beneficial insects. You'll see um, ID 128, Home Vegetable Gardening in Kentucky. That's a wonderful resource from uh, UK and KSU. Uh, very beginning gardening basics all the way from preparing your garden all the way to pest management and uh, making sure that you have um, all the resources in between to grow your crops. Of course, then the entomology website, and if you haven't done so already, you, you can subscribe to the Kentucky Pest News. So once you get onto that link there under social entomology, uh, you can like their um, Facebook page, Kentucky Bugs, and also get updates about um, you know pests going on throughout the state so that's where agents and um, technicians get updates about uh, insects and we then especially with the new um, with it the hornet that is out that's where we received that information USDA has wonderful resources as well not just for insects but other pests and diseases as well they have great information and mapping of the EAB and other resources as well. And um, as I already mentioned, Kentucky Pest News, a lot of this is not only for homeowners, but a lot for um, commercial growers as well. So I encourage you um, to, and, and it, I don't think that they're, no pun intended, they're not a pest uh, with all their emails. So um, just make sure you look at that. Um, to get some good information. I just want to share this one plant to you. Uh, I don't think, uh, I, I wasn't planning on doing this, but this is one of my favorite plants to invite into the landscape of our beneficial pollinator insects. And we have this growing happily in our education gardens in Campbell County. It's mountain mint, um, it, it is native, it, it's a vigorous grower was spreading by rhizomes. If you've never seen this or grown this plant, I encourage you to find it, share it with friends. Um, this is a plant that I have in my landscape and it really does dance in the summer uh, because of all of the pollinators that cluster on these beautiful flower buds and it smells really good. So that was short and sweet and I think I am actually kind of doing good on time. So here's my contact information. Please don't hesitate to email me, contact me by phone. Um, and um, as it was mentioned earlier, making sure that you reach out to your local extension office. Um, we are open during these times of the COVID-19 and we will be more than happy to help answer your gardening questions.